Good morning, how is everybody? Enjoyed the session so far? Good. So, as I've just been introduced, my name's Adam Hopkins and I'm part of the clinical team for, uh, for Medi UK and today's presentation is on vascular assessment and patient pathways. If you've got any questions, um, put your hand up. Uh, I'm happy to take questions throughout the, uh, throughout the session. So the aim of today's session is to look at assessment and that's looking at the, uh, the new messy ABPI MD for, uh, for ABPIs. Uh, we're also going to be looking at different methods of debridement uh, and focusing a little bit on the uh, UCS debridement cloth. And we're also going to be looking at compressing with confidence. Um, so managing patients um, and um, the patients that can self-manage, trying to, uh, to get them to self-manage as well. So looking at assessment, uh, the gold standard for assessment is to provide an accurate and specific uh, assessment process which identifies the co wound causality um, and any associated comorbidities affecting wound healing. Um, this information is then used um, to provide a comprehensive individualized care plan that's agreeable to the healthcare professionals that are delivering that and also the patient that's, uh, that's receiving it. Um, the care plan should be updated in accordance with the treatment response and as we all know clear documentation should be maintained throughout the, uh, throughout the process. So the reality of wounds, there are 2.2 million wounds that are treated annually in the, by the NHS at a cost of £5.3 billion. So the cost there is quite significant to the, uh, to the NHS. But only 14% of that cost is, uh, is down to wound, uh, wound products. The rest is for staffing and any hospital costs as well. And non-healing wounds are a major factor in driving the, uh, the costs up. Only 30% of wounds lacked a diagnosis and 80% of patients with lower uh, leg ulceration hadn't received an ABPI. Um, during a study of one year, only 47% of venous leg ulcers went on to heal. So that leaves 53% of venous leg ulcers that didn't heal in that, uh, in that year, which is quite significant. So holistic leg ulcer assessments. Um, they're quite comprehensive and, sh and co should cover quite a lot, of, uh, a lot of information. Medical history, looking at if there's any comorbidities that are preventing, uh, preventing wounds from healing. Uh, looking at medication, if there are on any steroids which are in, uh, inhibiting the inflammatory response. Uh, looking at any allergies. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff to, uh, to get through in a comprehensive assessment. So now I'm going to have a look at a little bit of ABPI. Who knows what an ABPI is? Put your hand up if you know what an ABPI is. There's quite a lot of you actually, that's, uh, that's really good. <laughs> Did you put your hand up? <laughs> so what is an ABPI? ABPI stands for Ankle Brachial Pressure Index. Uh, and this comp compares the arterial blood flow in your arm to that of your, uh, to that of your legs. And it identifies if there's any abnormalities in your arteries. Um, such as blockages, atherosclerosis, plaque, uh, and er any narrowing. Um, patients with arterial disease are contraindicated for, uh, for compression. The sign guidelines for 2010 uh, recommend that all patients uh, with venous leg ulcers should have an ABPI. And this little picture here, these two little pictures demonstrate the importance of AB ABPI quite, uh, quite well. So you've got a healthy artery there with no narrowing but you've got an, ar uh, an artery here with atheros atherosclerosis and plaque. So if you've got an artery like that, what don't you want to do? Pardon? You don't want to put compression on. Why don't you want to put compression on that artery? Because it'd squash it, you'd cut off the arterial blood supply to their, to their limb, and that would be quite bad for that patient, wouldn't it? So ABPI is quite important. So ABPI, it aids the holistic lower limb assessment. It assists in diagnosing, uh, diagnosing the, uh, the ulcer etiology as well. Um, and it can give you a guideline of how much compression to put into that limb so you don't uh, compress and incompress uh, an artery that isn't suitable for compression. Um, it identifies the need for any further investigations. So further investigations, if you were to think about further investigations that your ABPI would stimulate you to uh, refer on, where would, you, where would you refer on? Vascular, fantastic. Anybody else? Tissue viability. So you might do a tissue viability nurse referral as well. 
Um, so all guidelines recommend an up-to-date ABPI, ABPI uh, is done uh, before applying compression. Who can see this little graph? Can you see it at the back? Yeah? Oh, I was hoping you were going to say no, because I've got a bigger picture of it there. <laughs> I was trying to be clever. That didn't work, did it? <laughs> um, so I, I actually like this graph. Um, so on the bottom here are the, your ABPI results. So that's 1.2 leading down to 0.2. So you can say that's 120% of your arterial blood supply is getting to your lower limb. And that's only 20% of your arterial blood supply getting to your lower limb. So that, that's not very good. So what I would like to do is look at the 0.8 to 1.2. So 80% to 120% of your arterial blood flow getting to your limb. That's good. But it, and that falls into this box here. It would indicate that it's a venous leg ulcer and it was all, would also show that your patient would be suitable for full compression, and full compression is, is around 40 millimeters of mercury. Next level down is below 80%, but above 50%. That would indicate a mixed ulcer. Can anybody tell me what the two things are that, you, that the patient's suffering with, with a mixed ulcer? So the first one's venous, a venous leg ulcer, what would, this one, what would this one be? Mixed ATL group. But split that into two, you've got two pipes running through your body, haven't you? Venous and arterial. Venous and arterial. So that would indicate that it's both venous, both venous and arterial. And that falls into this little box here, which indicates, indicates reduced compression, which is 20 millimeters of mercury. Moving down the scale, so below 50% of your arterial blood flow getting to your limbs, what are you thinking if you're getting an ABPI result of, um, that falls into that? They've got serious issues. Yeah, I like that answer. They've got, these patients have got issues. Um, so that would mean that um, their, their arterial blood, blood flow is pretty poor. And who would you be, be referring to? Yeah, vascular. You'd be doing a, quite an urgent vascular referral and certainly making a few phone calls, wouldn't you? Um, so yeah, that's a pretty good little graph there to, uh, to, to help you understand the different ABPI readings to the, uh, to the compression levels that you'd be putting on that patient. So put your hand up if you can do a traditional ABPI. Again, you've got really good, uh, yeah, you've got a good level of training there. Well done. Um, so those of you that can't do a traditional ABPI, just put your hands up so I can see the people that can't. Okay. A question to you guys, can you put a blood pressure cuff on? Yeah, and can you press a button? Yeah, brill, that's good, we're at a good start. So the barriers to uh, ABPIs are the, you have to be quite highly skilled to, uh, so that's a compliment to you guys that can do ABPIs, you are highly skilled. Um, so you have to be quite highly skilled and well trained to, uh, to be able to do accurate ABPI readings. Um, they are sensitive to human error, uh, they do qu take quite a, uh, quite a bit of time. How long do you think it would take to do a, a traditional ABPI, roughly? An hour? Yeah, hour, good, okay, so about an hour. Um, would you say it's a popular task or an unpopular task? Unpopular, unpopular yeah. I'm a district nurse by background and I, I deal with quite a lot of district nurses in my, uh, in my current, jo current job. And um, when you speak to district nurses, they say, that's the first thing that they'll put to the back of the list, ABPIs. If they've got a busy day, yeah, we're not going to do that. We'll put that one, uh, we'll put that one for a few weeks' time. So they, they keep getting pushed further and further back. Um, so it, it is quite an unpopular task due to the, uh, the time that it takes to, to do it. And it also requires multiple pieces of equipment, gel and batteries. <laughs> How many times have you looked around for the gel and batteries and uh, you pull your hair out, don't you, trying to find them? Personally, I don't pull my hair out, but... Um, so there have been advances in, uh, in ABPI machines, and we've now got an automated uh, ABPI machine called Messi. Um, it's, a, it's a great bit of kit. It's very light. It's very portable. There's no resting period for your patient whatsoever. You just lay them down, put the blood pressure cuffs on, press the button. There's no calculations to be done whatsoever either, uh, and it's just very, very easy. Um, and we've got a short video for, uh, for you to watch just to, uh, to show you that. We've got it on the stand as well for you to come and have a look at after, uh, after the presentation.
For the measurement to be correctly performed, the patient must lie down. The arms must lie relaxed on the bed beside the patient. Place the yellow cuff on the left ankle, considering the arrow indicator. Leg cuffs have to be placed in a way so that they are aligned with the medial ankle. Place the green cuff on the right ankle, again considering the medial ankle. And red cuff on an arm, aligning the arrow indicator with the artery. There is a size indicator that tells you whether the cuff is the right size for the patient or if you have to use a bigger or a smaller cuff. It's also important that the cuff's tubes are straightened and not twisted before you start the measurement. Instruct the patient to relax and to remain quiet for a minute. Press the start button to start the ankle brachial index measurement. During the measurement, current blood pressure and pulse wave are displayed. The maximum pressure in the cuffs is calculated during the inflation and therefore varies from person to person. The inflation is simultaneous and controlled by an algorithm. After one minute, the ankle brachial index results are displayed in a colored scale that matches the international standard along with the brachial blood pressure. For detailed information about the measurement, press the I button. The table with systolic, diastolic, and medial arterial pressures for each extremity will show up. Hold the cuff in a way so that its inner side is turned up. First fold the smaller part in, and then wrap the other part loosely around it. The ABPIMD stand provides safe and easy storage for the cuffs, preventing the cuffs tubes from tangling and damage. There we go, that's messy. What did you think? Yeah, it's good. Um, so the benefits of the, uh, the automated oscillometric ABPI device are that it's, it's safe, it's fast, it's accurate because it eliminates any, uh, any blood pressure drift. Uh, it's very lightweight, there's no resting period whatsoever, and again, how many times do you, do you knock on the door and the patient gets off the bed, come and answer the door when, you, uh, when you're going to do the ABPI, um, or they need a wee halfway through nightmare, you've got to start all over again. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's no resting period, you just lay the patient down, put the blood pressure cuffs on, press the button. Um, it's automated calculations, so you don't have to figure, remember if it's leg, leg over or arm over. Um, readings can be taken over clothing, so if people have got leggings or jeggings on or the tights on, you can, uh, you can do that over clothing, or if they've got a loose top on, you can, uh, you can put the cuffs over there. Uh, there's no risk of calculation error. It's battery operated. You've got a mains charger, so you can charge that up, but it'll do about 50 ABPIs just on one charge, so uh, it's very rare that you would run out of battery. Um, it's user-friendly and portable. And there's also an error, error, error detection system. So if it brings up an error code, at least it's not giving you a, a false reading. And it gives you little instructions of what to do and how to rectify that. You usually just need to adjust the cuff a little bit. So repeating ABPIs. Um, AB, ABPIs should be, uh, should be repeated depending on the, uh, on the condition of the patient. Uh, high risk patients are every three months. Medium risk patients are every six months and low risk patients are every 12 months. And I'm guessing from a, from a nursing point of view or podiatrist point of view, we, we will probably struggle to fulfill these, uh, fulfill these recommendations with the, uh, the current method of, uh, of performing ABPI. So that's the assessment part done. Now we're looking at the, uh, the cleaning part. So there are lots of different types of debridement. There's autolytic debridement, there's mechanical debridement surgical and sharp, and again, you have to be highly, highly trained to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to perform sharp debridement. So we're just looking at mechanical debridement today. Who's uh, put your hand up if you've seen UCS? I've obviously seen it. Okay, there's quite a few of you that haven't seen UCS. So UCS is a, um, it's an ultra cleaning system. Um, that helps aid wound debridement and also uh, or skin cleansing as well. So it's a cloth 
Um, it works on, uh, on different actions, so there's the physical debridement um, and the unique fibres of the cloth, they're a looped system, so it picks up any debris from the, uh, from the wound bed, holds that into the cloth and then you can, uh, you can remove that. It's also got a solution in, so it's, all, it's already pre-moistened, so you don't need any additional water or any buckets and things like that, it just comes in the pack. Um, so in the solution you've got a mild, keratol mild keratolytic which softens and loosens the dead skin cells. It works well on sluffy, uh, sluffy areas and necrotic areas and uh, it, it's very good for cleaning the, uh, the, the wound bed. There's also a surfactant which breaks the surface tension of, tension of the wound bed and it, and it can remove any, uh, any devitalised tissue. It's really good for hyperkeratosis as well if you get buildup of hyperkeratosis around the wound or on the limb. It does soften that and it, it enables that to, uh, to lift. So this is a gentleman, um, he'd, he'd got non-healing diabetic, uh, diabetic foot ulcer. Um, I, think, I think it was three, sorry, just a second. It had this for four months prior to seeing the, uh, seeing the district nurses and there'd been no change whatsoever since his operation. Um, the exudate levels were, qu were quite high and there'd been no change in his wound. They decided just to change one thing in his treatment plan, and that was to use the UCS, de, uh, UCS debridement cloths. Um, it got quite a high level of slough on there as well. I think it was 50% when, uh, when he initially presented. Um, so the, uh, the district nurses used uh, the UCS to clean the wound and to clean the wound area. And in six, in six weeks, the, uh, the, slough, uh, the slough had severely reduced and there was significant, uh, significant wound healing as well. I think it was about 50% uh, at, at six weeks. And over the, um, over the, for the first three months, it resulted into uh, quite a significant reduction. And then after five months, it went on to, uh, it did go on to heal. And it was just one part of the, uh, the treatment regime that was changed was to use UCS. This one's quite an unusual one. This is a 74-year-old uh, man that had had a high-tension electrical injury, and it was the inside of his right leg where the, uh, the electric exited his, uh, his body, so that's, uh, that's quite an unusual one. He suffered with hypothyroidism, depression, and he was a pipe smoker, so looking at other comorbidities. Um, and that's a result after just one use of the, uh, the UCS debridement cloth. Um, it cleans it up very, very well, so then you can put your primary wound contact layer on there, any absorbent and, uh, and your dressing on top. I quite like this one because it reminds me a little bit of my grandma, uh, sorry, my grandpa. He, um, he used to play bowls and this gentleman played bowls as well. Uh, he was 80 years old, so lived quite, a, uh, quite an active life. And he banged his leg um, at a bowls match, resulted in, uh, in this. Uh, he had the wound for 11 weeks before he decided to go to his practice nurse at the GP surgery. Um, the practice nurse was looking after him for four weeks and not getting, uh, not getting very far. So the practice nurse spoke to the GP and they decided that he needed surgical debridement. Um, so they did a referral to the, uh, to the plastics department, but luckily they also did a referral to the tissue viability nursing team as well. And the tissue viability nursing team was able to see him before he actually got to plastics. Um, the tissue viability nurse decided to use UCS with him and they saw him twice a week and this is it on the first, um, the first clinic appointment and because the, uh, the, the solution in UCS continues to work even after you've, uh, even after you've put the dressings on, it still, start, still softened the, uh, the dry eschar and this is what it was like on the, uh, on the second visit, they used the UCS again and they were able to remove that SCAR. Third visit, it was looking absolutely fantastic. So at that point, the tissue viability nurse discharged the patient back to, uh, back to the practice nurse, and he was also able to, uh, to self-care as well because he used a juxta in, con um, in conjunction with the primary wound contact layer, and he did very, very well from it, from it and was, uh, was independent. It's also great for other hard-to-reach areas. UCS, because it's a cloth and it's nice and soft, you can wrap it around your finger. So if you've got cavities, you can clean inside the cavities. And also you can feel how much pressure you're putting onto, uh, onto the wound as well. And if the wound bed's feeling a little bit boggy, you know that you might not have, uh, might not have got as, far, as, as deep as, um, as, as it's going to go. 
Um, it's great for getting in between toes as well. You can fold it up and really get in between toes if you like cleaning in between toes. I quite like getting down. <laughs> um, and it's good for, uh, good for heels as well. You can reach around the back of patients' heels so you don't have to uh, dive underneath. So UCS is really quite unique because it's got the solution in the way that it removes the, uh, any debris. It's convenient and it's safe. Um, and it's a great way to clean the skin and wounds. Um, there's no additional equipment that's required. It can be used at every single dressing change. Uh, the active ingredients ensure the wound and the surrounding skin are effectively cleaned, debrided and well maintained, and it saves time and improves the skin. So, last part is the compression. So what are your thoughts processes when, uh, when deciding what compression systems to use? What do you think about? Pardon? You're reading that off there, aren't you? No? Okay. <laughs> Promise? <laughs> so patient compliance, yeah, compliance is a big thing. If they're not going to wear it, it's not going to work, is it? What else do we think about? Whether they're comfortable. So yeah, similar thing to compliance. I had, I had somebody actually earlier come up and, uh, and talk, well, they were talking about the, uh, the juxta range, which is what I'm going to talk about. And they were saying how, for the, the patients that fiddle, are they any good for those? Um, and if you've got compliance and they're comfortable, people don't fiddle, so they wear them. Yeah. Um, so can patients self-care? That's not necessarily something that's one of the, the first, thing that's, first things that people think about. So can they self-care? Um, what's going to achieve the best outcome for that patient? So there's quite a few things that, uh, that would be good to think about before you're choosing what, uh, what compression system you're going to be using. So this is an adjustable Velcro compression device. Uh, this is actually a, a juxta. Um, they are instantly readjustable. So if the uh, if the the egg, uh, sorry if the um, edematous level reduces, the patients can then retighten them up very quickly. Patients can tighten them up three, four, five times a day. So you're maintaining the uh, the correct level of compression. Um, there's also a little guide here, which is a built-in pressure system. And you can use that to measure how much compression you're putting in at each strap. So you, if you want reduced compression, you can set that at 20 millimeters of mercury. If you want full compression, you can set it at 40 millimeters of mercury. And you can build up to actually 50 millimeters of mercury, and it's all measured. So you know that you're getting the full level of compression and that it's graduate, graduated. And when patients apply it, they know how much compression they're putting into their legs as well. So it's very safe. So the benefits of using the adjustable Velcro, Velcro compression device is that it doesn't inhibit your ankle movement, so you still get the benefits of your, uh, your calf muscle pump. So your calf muscle pump aids your venous return, so you're still getting a, um, a, a good level of uh, a venous return. It allows patients to wear the normal shoes. I'm going to come back to wearing normal shoes in a little, uh, a little bit later in the presentation when we're looking at a case study, because one particular patient I was dealing with her shoe was a Nike Air Max with a be-all and end-all to her life. Um, and she wouldn't, wear, uh, she wouldn't wear her compression bandages because she couldn't wear a Nike Air Max. Um, so, yeah, shoes is important, and you've got the, uh, the, measure, um, the BPS card. So this is a randomized control uh, trial by Mosty. And the aim was to compare the difference between inelastic bandages compared to adjustable Velcro compression devices. And it was over a group of 40 patients. Um, both were left on the leg and reviewed after 24 hours and also at one week. The patients in the adjustable Velcro compression devices were, were asked to adjust it if it started to feel loose. Uh, the results showed that the sub-bandage pressures of the inelastic bandages were sig significantly higher initially but dropped considerably by 50% over the period of 24 hours. So they were losing the, uh, the benefits of the, uh, the compression. Whereas the adjustable Velcro compression devices remained unchanged because the patient could, uh, could adjust them when necessary. So this is a little bit about cost savings. The first section here is a community setting in London. And then this section here is a clinic setting that was, uh, was up in Scotland. So bear with me on this one. So six months prior to the trial, the bandage, co sorry, the dressings costs 
was nearly £10,000. We started the trial six months on, and the, uh, the dressing costs were just over 4,000. I think it was about 4,200. So it dropped considerably, just the, uh, the cost on dressings and your absorbent pads. Bandages, they were spending 20,000 pounds for the build-up, the, the six month build-up before, um, before the trial. And then the spend for the following six months was about 3,000 pounds. So they, they really reduced the, uh, the, their costs uh, and they had a total saving of nearly 20,000 pounds in that six month period. Um, then in the clinic, the clinic in Scotland, this was, uh, this was literally over 10 patients. So there are 10 patients that they changed, changed over. Uh, and the cost for the dressings was 5,000 pounds. And that dropped, dropped to, uh, I think it was 1,200 pounds for the following six months. And the cost of the inelastic bandages was 11,000 pounds. And the following six months after that, it was about 3,000 pounds. So just looking at it from a cost effectiveness point of view, the adjustable Velcro compression devices worked wonders on, uh, on, on every level. So this, uh, this is an 82-year-old lady, lovely lady. She was um, very, she was, she is very active, um, but she'd been suffering for 20 years with venous leg ulcers. Um, and they were very, very wet. She was having super absorbent. She was having a two layer bandage system. And she even got to the point where she was putting paper towels in the bottom of her shoes because she didn't want to ruin her shoes. And it was really, really bothering her as it would do after 20 years. Um, so the district nursing team that picked this lady up, they decided to, uh, to put her into a juxta light. And, and these are results. The, after a week, the exudate levels had reduced. After eight weeks, the exudate levels are pretty much gone and they were getting significant wound healing as well. And after 12 weeks, the left leg had, com had completely healed. The right leg had nearly healed, but it was a damn sight better than it was at week one. And that's just after 12 weeks. This is, this is a lady that's had venous leg ulcers for 20 years. And we see this quite regularly, the clinical team at Medi. Um, and that's her wearing a juxtas. She actually then went on to wear a, a Mediven compression hosiery to prevent the, uh, the, the reoccurrence of, uh, of her leg ulcers. And she was obviously very, very happy, as, as anybody would be after 20 years of suffering. This is my lady. Um, she's an IV drug user. She'd been using drugs since she was 17 years old. Um, she started with heroin when she was 18 and smoked crack cocaine. But she was actually a really lovely lady. She was nice. Um, she wasn't compliant with the bandages. She'd had venous leg ulcers for 10 years. And when I asked her why she wouldn't wear her bandages, I alluded to this earlier, it was because she couldn't wear a Nike Air Max. So it was, a, it was a learning curve for me. Um, drug users, the most important thing to them are the drugs. The second most important thing to them are the trainers. So if you ever deal with them, make sure you, you're talking trainer talk because they know what they're talking about with trainers. Um, so yeah, this lady, she, um, I didn't think her leg was particularly edematous when I first met her, to be fair. Um, but we put the, uh, the, the juxter on and um, a, a leg reduced considerably in size. So it slimmed, a, slimmed the leg down. The exudate levels weren't massive, but it did reduce the exudate levels. Um, and in not many months, a, a wound looked absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I'm assured by Kathy Chadwick, the, uh, the IV drug nurse up in Sheffield, um, that that's now, uh, that's, that has now gone on to heal. And that was presented at the uh, at Wounds UK a few years ago. It was a picture pr uh, picture presentation, um, and we're really proud of this uh, this lady. In fact, she she now sends her other IV drug user mates to this clinic to get a juxta. Um, so um, so yeah, we uh, we get quite a lot of people coming through. This is another good example of how achieving good compression uh, can improve patients' quality of life. Um, this also wasn't particularly big, but it was really painful for this lady. She got a pain score of 10 out of 10, and the exudate level was severe. Um, so this is the, uh, the build-up the 14 days before the juxta was applied. So the, it, the wound was macerated, it was wet, the exudate level was severe, and her pain score was 10 out of 10. So we applied the juxta. After seven days, the wetness had reduced quite a bit. It was still macerated, and she was getting the exudate, exudate but the wound had started to heal because we've got the right level of compression on for this lady. After 14 days, 
because the, uh, the condition of the wound had improved and the, uh, the maceration and the wetness had gone, um, and she started to get a little bit of healing. Um, I don't know if you found that yourself, if you reduce the, uh, the amount of exudate and, uh, and leakage from the leg, the, uh, the pain score drops. So after, after 14 days, it dropped to a, a seven. And I think that was really important for this, uh, this lady. She could, she could cope with having a leg ulcer, but it was a pain that was really, uh, really impairing her. Um, after 21 days, it dropped to a, a pain score of four. And I think pretty much everybody in this room would take a 21, a 21 days to get into a, a, score, a pain score of level four. And the wound as well had reduced by nearly half. And after 28 days, it was easily half. Um, that, wound was, uh, that wound was healing. She was quite a happy, uh, happy lady. So the summary of wraps. The adjustable Velcro compression devices provide 24-7 measurable compression. It provides a consistent pressure. Patients um, have a normal gait, can wear their normal shoes. It stays in place. Uh, there's a high, conc uh, high concordance. They're very simple to use. Um, if, you've seen them if you've never seen them before and you go to use them straight away, you do need a little bit of instruction, but five, 10 minutes and you'll be, uh, you'll be well away. Um, you don't have to be qualified to use these either, hence patients being able to, uh, to apply them themselves. Carers can, uh, can apply them and it promotes, promotes self-management. So in conclusion, a full holistic assessment is essential to ensure wounds are accurately diagnosed and receive their correct treatments in a timely manner. Uh, the automated ABPI machine offers a quick, safe and easy, easy solution to the challenges of completing ABPIs. Wound debridement is really key, uh, a key element in any wound kit regime and aids, aids wound healing. And the adjustable Velcro compression devices deliver accurate, adjustable, consistent compression at, at a therapeutic level, um, which aids wound healing and reducing edema.